Welcome to the Monday morning edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 529. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden on the 2nd of September 2019. You know, I guess it's not Labor Day for everybody. I kind of have the day off. I know George may or may not have the day off. Day off. Uh, clergy are clearly on call 24-7. You guys don't have Labor Day over there in England, do you? No, no Kevin, we've spent so long on the pre-show that the Stonehenge sun has now crept round and is, is <laughs> going to have to be dodging it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We did spend a long time on the pre-show. Well, uh, and we'll get to the pre-show in a second here. Uh, before we get into this long, varvacious, that's the word I have created, uh, show on Anglican Scripted, you have a responsibility as a faithful viewer. You need to like the program. Anytime you see a thumb, whether it's on Facebook or whether it's on YouTube, just click it. If you don't like the show and you want to click the thumbs down, that's okay. We, we can take the, the hint. I don't know what Gavin's doing right now. Please subscribe to the show if you want to be instantly updated. Anytime we have a new show posted on YouTube, you'll, the, you click that little bell right there and you'll be notified. Uh, sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. It's up to YouTube. I don't know. I don't care. Please add your comments to the comment section. That's the funnest part of the show is going and reading your comments every day about what you think about the topics we talked about, especially when you think we're wrong. That's that's fun to read about too. Uh, we have a podcast. It's not just video. If you look in the show notes on YouTube, we have a podcast you can click on, subscribe to, and have sent to your iPhone or uh, uh, phone device at any point in time. One of the comments... <laughs> Yeah, I know. <laughs> One of the comments we got in, in the comments was, how do you guys decide what you're going to talk about? How do you guys decide what the title is? And what's the pre-show like? And we just had a pre-show that went, to, it went about an hour. And pre-shows are fun. First of all, we sit there, we talk about our families, we talk about our wives, we talk about our lives. Then we get around to the news. Uh, sometimes we have to deal with the technical issues, like this week Gavin's in France and he's having pixelation problems. Apparently there's a big hurricane off the shores of Florida, so we're having pixelation problems with uh, Georgia's face as well, or they're just pixelated. We'll decide that later. And so that's what the pre-shows are like. Who decides the titles? I decide the titles. Who decides the picture? I decide the picture because I try to find a picture that's relevant enough that people will look at it and say, I want to know what they're talking about. So I'll try and get something with smiles or gav smacks and stuff like that. And that does increase the audience and the viewership. It, if I put up just a plain picture where all I go, nobody clicks on it. Don't know why. What, what, you, what you haven't admitted to is, is that as an editor, you, you decide the subject matter too. George and I throw all kinds of extraordinarily interesting, fascinating, diverting, and deep topics at you. And you just, and then you you put this list together, and by the time we finish the pre-show, your list has got nothing to do with what. <laughs> we want okay. To suggest. <laughs> Last week, the two of you wanted to talk about masturbation. No, no, uh -uh. No, 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 no. I said no, not, no, no, not on my show. No, no, no. <laughs> Only one of us did, and it wasn't me. <laughs> this and week, the topic to was going to be ED. No, uh huh. <laughs> they said no, no, no. We're not doing ED either. So, gentlemen, let's move on to the news. Oh, one of the complaints I got, I got three letters in the last couple of weeks about... Can I think of it quickly? Yeah. I wanted to say for our viewers who don't know what vivacious means, it's, being, it's a combination of verve and being vivacious. Uh, Peter Jensen years ago would describe <laughs> Gavin Ashenden as being winsome. Winsome. I think we now we can use the description. I'm serious. <laughs> That's how he described him. The winsome <laughs> Gavin Ashenden. Now, Gavin Ashenden is now vervacious. He has verve and panache, but he is also vivacious, alive, and attractive. So, I, I think I did, the dear, dear Peter Jensen has reached for a whole host of adjectives during the course of the ups and downs of our relationship. <laughs> Okay, so I do want to, at this point, get away from our pre-show and move on to the news. We talked about five or six different things, and I brought up a complaint I got. I got uh, two or three people sent some emails the last couple of weeks saying, 
guys, all you do is talk about the Church of England. And that's fine and all, but it's a whole communion. Can you talk about more stuff than that? And we're going to. We're going to talk a little bit about the Episcopal Church, the uh, Church in India, and other places, and the Church of England. It did, it did come up in the news today. But I thought the best way we could approach this is to talk about the Episcopal Church tech in the 1970s, the 1980s, and 1990s, where it was just full of crazy people. And they always made the news, and the CNN trucks were outside, and the BBC trucks were outside, recording these people saying stupid things all the time about their theology and about, their, uh, about the church. And that doesn't happen anymore. That's come and gone. Uh, tell me some of your memories as a reporter of the, uh, the early days of, of tech, George. Well, I've had a number of stories that I'm quite proud of, and I remember Oakwise the Druid. Oakwise... Uh, was an Episcopal priest or a parish in Downing Town, Pennsylvania, who for his dress with robes and go out into the woods with a sickle and with other pagans uh, celebrate the solstice and dance around uh, an altar and paint himself blue. And I also remember in 1997, uh, a magazine was given to General Convention by Trinity Wall Street with a commendation from Ed Browning, the presiding bishop. And inside this magazine was an article about a raccoon spirit guide, how a New York Trinity, how a New York priest found his true being by allowing, by ingesting peyote and having a shaman and following this raccoon through an under, un, into the underworld. Friends, this is where we were. What happened to these people? Well, they've moved to England. <laughs> this is what happens when you don't talk about the Church of England. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the reason why we talk about the Church of England so much is because that's where the action is right now. But for nine years, Kevin and I were kept so busy by Catherine Jeffrey Shorey, and before that by Oakwise the Druid and Charles Benison, and before that by Jack Spong and Raccoon Spirit Guides, or Gaia Masses, where women clergy under the moonlight raise up a, gla uh, a honey and, uh, and uh, ne you know, Hector, yeah, yeah. Never, never, never find that kind of thing happening today, George. We no, but th here's the thing: is these people had their day in the sun, and they would get on the New York Times of what the latest Episcopal Church is up to, and and for a lot of uh, people who who split from the Episcopal Church, it was this sort of stuff that was really too much, because this was satanic, this was demonic, uh, and what do we have today? Well, we've got the Bishop of Massachusetts joining a lawsuit against President Trump because because the border wall. And I'm thinking, bring back Oakwise the Druid. <laughs> I know. Well, and that's... Bring back Catherine the... Sermon, where she denounces the Apostle Paul for casting out a demon in a slave girl uh, is in Ephesus. I mean... Where are the Catherine Jeffrey Shores these days? And what And what we found is that they have all moved to England. Yes. All of these crazy things that we had 20 years ago are now popping up on the shores of England. And like recently, Nadia Bowles-Weber, the sort of Lutheran pastrix, who's a, who is basically her sale-by date has gone. If she She's were a has-been. Has has take her off the yeah. shelf and pitch it in the back. Mm -hmm. Where can she, but where, who, who buys her wares these days? Not Americans. The House of Bishops of the Church of England has her leads a retreat. The Church Times has an in-depth interview with this woman. God, the Church of England is so passe. They're, they're rubes. They just are not on the cutting edge anymore. They're 20 years behind the times. And, and so the states that cause this, it's happening now in England. Yeah. Well, yeah. actually, just just to strike a serious note, because I mean that, that is all true. One of the things I've been saying to some of my friends is, um, look, it, it's obvious that we are simply repeating the dynamics that tore Anglicanism apart in North America. Wouldn't it be smart if, knowing all the mistakes they made, and we do know almost all of them, we we went out of our way not to make those mistakes. Wouldn't it be great if we didn't build little empires and, and turn into schismatic groups against the other, you know, one another, but instead we learned to cooperate in, in humility and with gratitude and largesse amongst the Orthodox. And, 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 and my goodness, we're repeating 
There were exactly the same mistakes. Georgie, was you who in the pre-show chat said, um, who was it that made that special quote about history repeating itself? And I, I couldn't remember. It was um, Marx, uh, wasn't it? I, I, well, it was. It was It was Marx quoting yeah. Hegel saying, so Hegel said history repeats itself. And, and Marx said, yeah, first time was tragedy, second time was farce. Yeah, farce yeah. Well, guess who represents farce in this narrative? <laughs> Church of England. <laughs> we weren't going to talk about them. <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, we're going to talk about them, but we'll, we're going to spice it with other narratives from other uh, um, provinces. Now, the interesting thing here about the Episcopal Church is we've had the clown Eucharist. We've had the, the things that are just a shame done in the cathedrals. Um, and now we get to see it again repeated in the Church of England. Did the Church of England not see what happened to the Episcopal Church and the fallout and the people leaving the pews and forming another uh, province in the ACNA? Uh, what what do they not get about history repeating itself? Uh, Kevin, that is such a good question. I, 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 wish, I wish I had the faintest idea of, of how it is possible that uh, English Anglicanism has paid no attention. I, I, I suppose it's, it's, um, you know, the idea that if you're if you're in the middle of the goldfish bowl, you don't look outside it, or you don't see, you see what is outside it. But it is extraordinary the, 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 the self referentialness, the way in which we're doing a certain kind of progressive Christianity in this country today. But but it, it's not just the heterodox, the orthodox. I'm afraid I think are being equally self referential and and careless. Of the wider context, and it, it, you know, it's not as if people haven't said or pointed it out. Um, you know, they, they have ears but hear not, and eyes that see not. Um, perhaps it's a spiritual mystery we can't we can't solve. Well, George, in the last five years, we've reported on porn being shown in the cathedrals in England, helter skelters, uh, putt putt golf. Uh, it goes now yoga. Yoga is the new thing. It just keeps Not going five on. Years, five months. Five months. This year. This year. 2019. <laughs> this year. You know, and, you know, here in America, we've been there and done that. And now I look over at the Church of England. They're celebrating the presiding Bishop Michael Curry as the greatest thing since sliced bread. And he's overseeing this type of. Uh, liberal church. He, he's not a progressive like Catherine Jefford Shorey was, but he's not taking them off course. Uh, no, 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 Kevin. I disagree with you. Well, I agree with you, but I'm going to take it in a different direction. Right, they fine. don't care one whit what Michael Curry says. All right. Michael Curry's words matter not. He's a black man who's entertaining. And the Church of England likes having a black man who's entertaining as somebody who they can put out front and say, oh, look, we have a black man who's entertaining. The Church of England doesn't care one bit of what Michael Curry has to say. They don't emulate a single one of his policies. He is a token for the, you know. We had Roy and Prince uh, Harry well, were basically asked at one point, well, did, how did it come about that you asked uh, Michael Curry? We don't know him. Uh, it was Justin Welby. Why did Justin Welby do this? For the PR value. Now, Michael Curry has his faults. But I think at the end of the day, he's a believer, he's a Christian, and he's much, much improved over his predecessor. He's not, of course, from Central Florida, where all is rosy and golden. But so here's, here's the thing. Welby has no interest in the substance of Michael Curry. He has interest only in the image and the symbolism of Michael Curry, thinking that, hey, maybe this is the magic solution, this is the magic pill that will not win people to Christ, but will get me a pat on the head from the editors of The Guardian. So I agree with you, Kevin, but at the same time, I, I'm more cynical in what I see as Welby's machinations with, uh, with uh, Michael Curry. I like and don't think that Michael Curry, don't think that Michael Curry, and I've heard him talk at the uh, executive council, and I've seen all this, where basically Curry is saying, look, you know, we have to put up a lot of crap from the, uh, from the Anglican Communion and the Church of England who patronize us yeah, we're paying the bills. Yeah, that's and right. at a certain point, this has got to stop. I'd like to put in a word for Justin Welby at this, at this point, because I think you're too hard on him, George, and, and you missed the main point. Um, he does care. <laughs> Stop that. That's so oh, good. that's sweet. 
he does he does care about people meeting Jesus Christ. My great theological beef and spiritual beef with Justin Welby is it's the wrong Jesus. Uh, it, it, you know the whole his his whole um, uh, charism of reconciliation is based on a kind of United Nations Jesus Christ. Uh, which bears very little resemblance to the real one in the Gospels. The real one in the Gospels says some very kind and generous things and some very hard things as well. But you don't find Justin Welby. Justin Welby's Jesus doesn't say any of the hard things about making choices and repenting. So it's a kind of Michael Curry, United Nations Jesus Christ. And my, my, my frustration is, that he goes around muttering Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ all the time. And all the evangelicals say, wow, look how born again he is. But but he's more woke than born again. It's the wrong Jesus. Gavin, uh, you sometimes need some exercise. Did you ever do yoga? <laughs> I have a place I, now in England, a cathedral, so to speak, where you can go and perform yoga and the priest will lead it for you. Tonight I, I, at seven o'clock. <laughs> I, I was once uh, speaking at a conference uh, on deliverance with um, Orthodox and Roman Catholic exorcists mm -hmm. uh, on the island. Where well, swimming accident off the coast? I must. I should remember. Ro Rhodes. It was in Rhodes, um, and I remember having a stand-up row with one of the Roman Catholic exorcists, who was probably the most powerful spiritual man I've ever met because he wanted to tell the uh, the people who were there that they must avoid all new age stuff right down to aromatherapy he was saying that actually in his experience the problem in the spiritual battle was that the moment you began stepping into an arena which was demonically defined or demonically inspired you began to lose some of the protection that Christians have by virtue of their baptism and their prayers against the kind of infiltration of the demonic. So we're not talking about possession, we're talking about oppression. And I, I stood up on the stage and said to him, you know, Father John, you're frightening everybody. I, I don't think aromatherapy gives the demons that much traction. And I mean, he folded his arms and he gave me hell on stage. And he said, you know, <laughs> he said, you're just a junior exorcist. What do you know? And now, I, the, the only reason I tell this story is that we were arguing about the, the kind of very soft fringes um, he was very, very fierce about yoga indeed. He said that when you do yoga, you engage in a metaphysical and a symbolic submission to a whole series of Indian deities who are demons, and they are real. And what you do is you invoke them by your spiritual gymnastics. And he said that the problem is that nobody in the West takes the demonic and the spiritual seriously. And they think this is some form of eclectic spirituality. But, he said, what, what people are actually doing is allowing oppressive energies, entrance into what they're doing. Now, let's just assume for a moment he might be right. <laughs> um, the idea that the Church of England invites people into this further oppressed demonic energy. But, but, but it's not just a yoga, of course. It, it all takes place... Um, under symbol of the moon, which I thought was very sweet until I discovered that they were invoking Gaia. Uh, and the, the, Gaia is a form of recapitulation of Canaanite fertility worship. Uh, it, it, is, it is the fructitious she who must be placated. And there's a very close relationship between the whole ecological movement and Canaanite fertility worship and the placating of the fertile she. The Church of England not content with um, uh, offering yoga does a double whammy and invites people into the latest update of Canaanite fertility worship. And if you wonder what 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 Jesus thinks about it, whom Jesus said should be, he and the prophets were very angry indeed about this kind of syncretism on behalf of God's people. The Church of England shows no such sensitivity. And from a practical standpoint, this does not bring people into church. The statistics for the National Episcopal Church were released on Friday, and it shows that the average Sunday attendance declined about 4.5% for domestic diocese this past year, 2018. We're way past the fights of people walking out over property issues and things like that. Um, we're way past uh, raccoon spirit guides. 
But all of these things that have been tried, they've been tried for 20 years. And the result has been the death of liberal mainline Christianity. Now, not all Episcopal churches, not all Episcopal dioceses are tanking. But those who have pursued this uh, relevance of trying to market the church to, ma to the mass consumer sensitivities have failed. It, it's the, the, the cathedral in Peterborough is charging 15 pounds for you to bring your mat, lie on the floor, stare at a, a giant moon structure called Gaia, who is an earth goddess, and led by a priest in yoga positions. Friends, you can do it a lot cheaper, a lot more comfortably in a yoga studio with a real yoga instructor. And after the novelty of being on a cold stone floor wears out, and the novelty of don't doing something slight that you know is naughty, guess what? It doesn't work. It's the same with the putt putt. I mean, we're told that on the Sunday after Norwich Cathedral had uh, the this, the uh, helter skelter, they had eighty people at evening prayer. Well, they're not telling us how many were this weekend, or how many were the weekend. You know, or the past weekend. In other words, you get these little bumps, but they don't amount to anything. No, it's and a, yet we we point them in time exponentially, and they don't go into this this fraud. This see here's here's where I get frustrated because this has been tried, it's been found wanting, and now we've had these leaders in the Church of England so desperate, so desperate to keep the doors open that they're going to do and say and try anything, even in when it's been demonstrated to be a complete waste of time. I don't want to put the boot in too, too hard, but I think one of the most banal things that Justin Welby has ever said was that you, you don't know what you're doing if you're not having fun in a cathedral. Um, the, I, I mean, that's where the, you know, the whole Helter Skelter and the pitch putt golf comes in. The, that, that's the uh, imprimatur for it from the top. Um, and it's not, but, but it makes this terrible distinction between, between the flesh and the spirit. In the flesh, we have fun. In the spirit, we have joy. But joy and fun are not the same, and they don't come in the same way. It's a terrible thing for the Christian community to be found saying as his mantra, which he's trying to pass on to his church. Well, Justin wasn't in a cathedral when he said this, I don't think. I think he was at the Greenbelt um, event they held a week or two ago. He was asked his thoughts on Brexit, and he said it's time for... The people who want to remain, called the remainers, to stop whining. And whining or whinging? I'm not. You know, Gavin, I, it's just. Gavin, I, is there? It, that's not an American word. Whinging is that? Whinging. A, or is that just my reading quickly and not catching all the uh, consonants? Do you happen to know which word he used? <laughs> I'll look it up while we're look, talking. Look it up. Well, and you have to because it's an English word. It's like the boot, which is really not a trunk, but it's the trunk. It is, it's what it is. So Gavin's going to look up that English word for us. Now, having read lots of stories and comments from Justin Welby over the past two years, I would have thought he was a person who was a remainer who wanted to influence other people to remain. This it's statement. It's what? Whinging. Whinging. And what does that mean? Whining. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, back to you Justin. Here, folks. <laughs> you are <right> here. <laughs> Justin Welby has uh, demanded people uh, who want to rehash this over and over again to stop whining, whinging, whatever you want to call it. As much as I am completely surprised that this came from Justin Welby, if he were this clear on homosexuality in the church, the gospel of all the topics of the day, he would be an awesome archbishop. But he's not that clear. This is the one item I've seen him clear about. Or, Go ahead. Well, I'm a bit, uh, call me skeptical. Call, uh, well, this was reported by the Church Times. And this took place uh, two the weekend before, two days before, uh, just the Times reported that Justin Weldy had uh, uh, been approached to lead a people's parliament, an alternative 
People's Assembly to help bring people together over the Brexit issue. Now, what? so Welby evidently was telling, and here's what Welby said. He said that uh, I'm a Democrat and we're going and we have to play by the rules and the people voted and this is the this is it and we just and we have to quit whinging and complaining about the outcome and just live with it and go forward now what if he said the same thing about the gospel and human sexuality this is what it says this is what we have to do we have to go study and withdraw from the world and this that well so two days before the public announcement comes that he's going to be the great arbitrator and peacemaker, he hits the Remainers with uh, the claim that they're being childish and immature. Now, one of the things that we have heard reported, and Gavin can speak to this more clearly, is that this did not come, this invitation to lead the alternative assembly did not come out of the blue. This was not a, oh my goodness, I'm shocked that you would ask me how sweet of you. <laughs> uh, Gavin, what have you heard? Oh, I'm so sorry. You lure me into conspiracy theories, and I'd spend my life trying to avoid them because they they reflect very badly on one's mental stability, and I can't afford to have anything reflect even worse on my on my public mental stability. But the thing is, one one of the things that Justin Welby did was to buy up three or four very sophisticated journalists at huge cost and remove them from able to comment freely on his competence and put them on his payroll where they can't comment freely on his competence. Now, I, I can't believe that they're just sitting on their hands and not taking a view about the news. And it seems to me to be inconceivably incompetent for them to allow him to go to Greenbelt two days before they know there's going to be this explosive announcement about, about this, this alternative non-parliamentary assembly. Uh, in which, which is going to be made up completely of Remainers, even though they say it's not, it's a Remainers idea. I think, and this is where the conspiracy comes in, that what he was told to do was to say something nice about Brexiteers. Because again, the Greenbelt Festival would have been Remainer to a person. It would have been dripping Europhile, um, pan-international solidarity. That's that you know it that's what I'm part of so i just that justin welby would have courted unpopularity by gratuitously saying that unless it had been designed to be a public comment that could be used as a kind of fire insurance policy when he when he did the really important thing which was stepping into the public limelight uh, uh, at what what appears to be his own initiative <laughs> and uh, to look at to to, to uh, offer reconciliation again in the Jesus Christ United Nations mold of come along now kids play nicely uh, so I, I'm afraid I, I I don't see it as innocently as you do George but it just could be that your character and your soul are more pure than mine and through the, the light of your purity we see more truth and, and <laughs> I just see the field to you what a great place for a transition okay We've talked about the Episcopal Church. We've talked about the Anglican Communion globally. We've talked about the Church of England. George, we've had some new bishop elections and new archbishops. I thought we could talk about that to, to round up and close out the program vervaciously. Yeah, the, now recently the uh, vervaciously. Uh, yeah, there's been a spate of Episcopal elections and appointments. Nigeria just elected six and translated to seventh bishop uh, and we we have a new archbishop of Kenya and I think there's really encouraging news about that election now we already sort of knew because Ken the I'm uh, sorry Uganda excuse me uh, the new Ugandan archbishop they broke one of the they're more mature than the Church of England or the Episcopal Church is at this stage sure because what happened was that in the past we would see sort of alternations between east, west, north, and south, where in essence it was next the next tribe's turn. It was a the tribal, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the government said, no, this is our preferred candidate. Well, they broke all those. They broke that completely, and they actually picked, they actually did what they said they were going to do, a lot, leave it up to the Holy Spirit and seek the best man whom, whom God is clearly speaking about the future of the church. And every report I have read 
is that there wasn't the politics of the past. There wasn't the tribal jockeying. There wasn't the log rolling. And this really is a good step because here is a man who is the new Archbishop of Uganda who is beholden to God, not to the Uganda tribe or to the Acholi bishops in the north. So that's, that is a, that is a, is, is a degree of maturation we're seeing develop in the African church, which is remarkable. In Ireland, of all places, we had the Bishop of Derry and Rafoe elected, Andrew Foster. And why do we care? Well, the previous Bishop of Derry and Rafoe was a bit of a dud, a, a weather vane. No, no matter which way the wind blew, these fellows that would always be the majority, no matter how the majority voted. And they picked a solid evangelical. In Australia, the Bishop of Bathurst was elected, and they picked a solid evangelical. So we've got a number of really there's a new generation of people coming in in their early and mid 50s into the Episcopal office in the developing world and in Australia, uh, uh, Ireland. And I think what is even most exciting is that on Saturday, a Kenyan was consecrated bishop in Nelson, New Zealand. Hmm. Wow. This man uh, moved, moved to New Zealand about 15 years ago and headed up the Church Mission Society. He's a third generation Anglican priest. But we've reached the point where the best are rising to the top. We have this thing called merit, spiritual merit, holiness, that is putting, that God is placing men at, in, in positions of Episcopal authority who have a charism of, it's not because of the gender or the right party. So these are really good indications of the healthiness and vigor of a portion of the Anglican world. See, we do report good news. All right, so Georgia's pixelation is getting worse because of the storm going on there. Gavin, when are you returning to England? Um, very shortly. Very shortly, so we'll get Even some then. better in in internet for you. Um, now I'm going to ask you guys, as viewers of the program, to take a few minutes and pray for those in the path of the hurricane that's going to uh, uh, run up the shores of the East Coast here in America. Um, it's going to be uh, a gobsmack of a, a storm, and uh, some people's lives will be lost, and we need to certainly keep them in our prayers uh, as, you close out, as we close out the program. Um, it's been in my heart all week, and uh, certainly with uh, Gavin and George as well. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and we've been threading our way carefully through the Scylla and Charybdis of the whinging and the vivacious in order to remain genuinely unscripted.